before I begin tonight, uh, I, I do want to talk because we're so close uh, to the anniversary of September 11th. I want to go back for just a few minutes to that day. Uh, on September 11th of last year, I was headed into Washington, D.C. in my capacity as the chairman of the Religious Freedom Coalition. One of those laws or bills that we had been working on, or I had been working on, was the Sudan Peace Act. Now, in the southern Sudan, in the last decade or so, there have been about two million Christians murdered by the radical Islamic government of the Sudan. Many of the families, the children have been, been taken away, and men have been murdered, and the children have been taken away and sold into slavery. In fact, there are many groups in the United States, several groups that just exclusively raise money in order to buy those children back from slavery. Well, we were able to pass the Sudan Peace Act out of the House very readily. And what the Sudan Peace Act did was basically say that any of the companies, particularly the oil companies working in the Sudan, uh, that uh, were financing the Sudanese government to buy weapons buy bombs in order to kill the Christians in the South, that those companies could no longer obtain funds on the capital markets of the United States. In other words, they couldn't sell stock here, couldn't sell bonds here, couldn't borrow money here. And they would be faced with either do business with the Sudanese or get out of the United States. Of course, they'd have to stop doing business with the Sudanese. And we believed that what this would do is the oil companies would go to the Sudanese government and say, look. You're going to have to stop murdering the Christians in the South, or we're going to have to quit doing business with you. And that would have probably been what happened. However, as I said, we passed the bill overwhelmingly out of the House. It got over to the Senate. We had more than enough votes to pass it in the Senate, and all of a sudden, our votes disappeared. And we found out that forces influential to President Bush inside of the White House had convinced the president that it was bad business to interfere with the capital markets of the United States. Now, a couple of these individuals are good friends of mine, senators, in fact, that went to the president and said, we cannot interfere with the capital markets uh, for over political issues such as this. So our votes vanished. And on that morning, on September 11th, I was actually headed into Washington, D.C., in order to go to a news conference with Senator Brownback and several congressmen, including Congressman uh, uh, Davis of Virginia, uh, that in order to try to win back those Senate seats and to get our bill passed. And I was about halfway into Washington, D.C. I had left a little bit late because I dropped my daughter off at, uh, at uh, the Christian school she attends there. I, when I heard about the first aircraft slamming into the World Trade Center, and I heard, you know, oh, it's a, maybe it's a small plane, there's fire, there's, I knew instantly what had happened. You see, because the first time that these folks had tried to blow up the World Trade Center, they failed. And they vowed that they were going to do it again. We just didn't pay any attention to them. When the second aircraft slammed into the World Trade Center, remember, I'm in rush hour traffic. It's a 50-mile drive, and I'm not doing more than 20 miles an hour. I called a friend of mine in the White House. I'm going to tell you what I told him. I said, you know who did it. I know who did it. The military knows who did it. The CIA knows who did it. The FBI knows who did it. I said, by now, the president knows who did it. I said, we have to stop treating these terrorist acts, these war crimes against the United States as if they're common crimes, which is what we did in 94 when they bombed the World Trade Center to start with. We sent out the police to arrest these people. We brought them back to the United States, and we gave them a fair trial. We provided attorneys for them. 
We paid their legal fees out of our tax money, millions of dollars in legal fees we paid out of our tax dollars to help defend the people that tried to blow up the Trade Center the first time. We gave them a fair trial and we put them in jail. And I said, we can't do that anymore. We are fighting a war. And you can't fight a war with policemen. You have to fight a war with soldiers. Well, just as I hung up from talking to him, I was passing the Pentagon on 395, headed into Washington, D.C. It was at that instant that American Airlines 77 slammed in to the Pentagon and the, literally shook the windows on my uh, Jeep. I got into D.C. and the Capitol building was being evacuated because the fourth aircraft was headed toward Washington, the one that was stopped. I was interested. They had uh, uh, Mr. Beamer's wife on Dateline last night, and they said that he had, he and she had met at a small private school. Wasn't that an interesting comment? They just couldn't admit that they came from a Christian school, could they? I had to say private, small private school. Yes, it was small private Christian school. Um, the Capitol was being evacuated, so we didn't hold our news conference. I got over to my office and immediately tried to work the press to lead them. I even went over to Fox and did a, a short segment on Fox TV. And, um, you know, it's, it, it was just to no avail. It is just we are, are blinded by some kind of political correctness that will not allow us to point a finger at the end. Uh, that afternoon, on the afternoon of September 11th, I was telling people the problem is the Wahhabi sect in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, our ally, is financing all of this. This is the problem. Oh, no, these are our allies. They wouldn't do a thing like that. It turned out that of the 19 hijackers, 17 were Saudi citizens. All middle class, upper middle class, most of them college graduates, all of them with money in the bank, all of them from good families. But they have been taught the hatred of Wahhabism from the mainstream Saudi, what Saudi teaches. I got so frustrated in the two weeks after the September 11th attack of what was going on that I actually bought an advertisement in the Washington Times. And on that advertisement, I put, name this nation. And I put, no elected leaders, no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly. Religious police beat people in the street. Secret police uh, arrest folks, and they're never heard from again. What nation is this? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Well, finally, we have some people trying to begin to see the problem. Who was Mohammed? Well, he was born in 570, and he had both a Christian and a Jewish background. And he didn't attack his first caravan and kill people until he was 53. And that began the killing and the plundering. He tried to take his message. Whoever wouldn't accept his message, he killed. When the Jews wouldn't accept his message, he killed them. One Jewish town, Medina, surrendered to him. The next day, the next morning, he marched the men out, six at a time, every man in the village, had their heads chopped off, and then put the men and the women into slavery. Since Muhammad began that, there have been three great fatahs against the West. Of course, his in the seventh century, which 
took over the Arabian Peninsula and parts of Persia. The 11th century Fatah against Europe. And then the 17th century Fatah that was stopped by the bravery of the Serbian army at the gates of Austria at great sacrifice. And now we're in the fourth great Fatah. Now I hear about Islam being a religion of peace, and it is. Dar, dar, dar al-Islam means region of peace. And in Islam, Dar al-Islam, the region of peace, are the areas controlled by Islam, and Dar al-Harb is the region of war. Those are the regions not controlled by Islam, the region where war must be conducted in order to control the dhimmi. That's us, people of the book, Jews and Christians. Well, I was amazed, and the reason I, I wouldn't have gone to this depth in it, if it would have not have been for the headlines the last two days in the, all the big newspapers, and I don't know if you've seen them here, but the Washington papers, the New York papers, the National Education Association, the Teachers Union, and I, I don't want to offend any teachers in here because I understand you have to pay your dues regardless of what you believe, has set out guidelines for September 11th for teachers to teach your kids about September 11th. Those guidelines include showing the intolerance of Americans and in interring Japanese Americans, how we treated the American Indians, and how our foreign policy caused September 11th. I, that's what our kids are going to face. Now, I, I I'll tell you this, I don't, and like I said, I don't want to upset any teachers because I want to tell you that in the surveys that came along with this, the polls, said that most of the teachers that belong to the NEA were going to throw their guidelines in the trash and tell the kids the truth. What amazes me about this is that the union dues of all those teachers were used to do all the research to come up with this garbage to send out. That's what was upset. What do we do? Well, I'll give you my perspective of what I think where we are in the world with this, with the whole issue. There are moderate Muslims. There have been some that don't want war, don't want to kill Christians, don't want to kill Jews. Unfortunately, Somebody always has the words of Muhammad to go back to. We have had people that have done terrible things in the name of Jesus. But you know what? We always had Jesus' words to go back to. That's the difference. That's the difference. When will this end? This great fatah will end the way the first three did with some great military defeat that causes Islam to retract for a few hundred years so that our great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren or great-great-great-children can fight the battle all over 